let's um, record. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's get started. So for everybody who's here, what I'd like to do is, so it's been our first full long week. Um, so, you know, we're trying to stabilize some things as far as the workflow. We also sent out a review form. If, um, uh, let me put the current, let me share my screen here. Um, so everyone can see screen entire screen go live so um, from my log you can get into the today's session uh, let's put that in the chat it's in the chat under what bot test let's where did I put it apprenticeship 2021 Let's put it in there. So that's the current working document for today. So we'll run off that as kind of the index. And then uh, I'd like to start by uh, goal clarity. So one of the things that emerged from last time was, okay, wh why are we here? Okay, what's going on? We're doing a lot of things like trying to get into the enterprise session and the incentive challenge. We decided, okay, the first thing first, like uh, feedback was, at least from last week, that we want to fo really focus on one thing at a time that's easier for people and uh, go from there. So the absolute highest priority is the house, right? So, you know, if we think about what the goal of the apprenticeship was, it was to, to allow anybody to work with OSC um, afterwards or anybody who takes the program so that there's a way to generate revenue. Uh, and we're saying that, okay, if we develop the house, if that's a full product, then that's a definite way to go forward. So the idea was the house plus supporting technologies around it, but I, I think the house is, I mean, if there's supporting technologies, then uh, could work, but I think the, the most clear revenue model is on the house because of the size of that market and all that, just like we've been talking about. But maybe we can um, uh, start with, um, start with that question, like are we clear, like what's, why are we here? And, and I think that the biggest thing is to say, okay, there's a lot of different things that everyone's involved in and we might be doing all kinds of other projects, but what is the common core that we come here and we can collaborate on that and work together to, to develop something that's solid in, a, in this kind of collaborative way with, with a, the additional bonus that it's open to the world and we're not hiding any of our enterprise blueprints that we're gonna develop. It's a, it's a thing that anyone in the entire world can benefit from. So it's kind of a unique, unique thing, and tr you know we're trying to figure out how to make this work and make it effective. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of the work around the CDCO home, just going through the, the due diligence of the, the CAD design. Um, some feedback I got was also that we should, you know, when, when I go through this stuff, maybe we should have more hands-on practice. So I kind of want to design this session in the morning here just to go through some basic exercises that we can all follow and make sure we're on the same page because. Uh, as you see the CAD model of the house, it's going forward. Uh, I mean, what's interesting about it, so look at that, I mean, um, it's, the promise is, I, I was kind of encouraged by initial signs of the promise, which is, okay, even people from remote can contribute uh, because we're an open process, and that's actually, that is happening. Um, so, for example, uh, if you look at the house model as it is right now, a few people, there was some contribution where someone who's not on our team, they put in a few modules, and we're all doing this collaboratively, working on individual modules and then putting them into this final doc. But, yeah, it's coming along. It's, I think it's pretty cool. And just try to see the fruits of what we're doing using the positionally aligned locations. So that's, that part is pretty cool. Um, but maybe, um, let's see, so maybe... Maybe we could quickly go around, like, I mean, as far as that clarity of, of what we're here. So to me, that is the full digital model. I mean, we can't do anything without it, you know. Uh, everything falls out from it. All kinds of documentations, animations, other digital assets, games, you name it. Um, that's, that's the critical part. So I think there's no, no question about that. And then building the house so over the next next week let's see how how far we can get to finishing it I, ideally if we uh, get this model into place 
um, by all of us contributing to each, each of these modules, we can have a quick way to, to show the cut list. Because the digital model, one thing you get out of it is readily, ac readily accessible cut lists that you can just look at it and bam. You can, you can not only uh, look at it, but also you can uh, hide on hide parts. You can actually make a little exploded part animations that show you how the thing goes together. So it's a critical asset. And of course, the, the cut lists and build cheat sheets that we can get out of that um, in a way that we do it and then we have no mistakes at the end. So, um, and then the enterprise on a house, ability to collaborate with OSC for a living. So, uh, but maybe, um, I don't know, should we, should we kind of back up to, to last week's discussion and say, okay, are, are we pretty clear, like what's, how we go forward or is that the way to go? So just focus on the house. We really cut out, basically cut out the other sessions which we were going to and maybe save that for later uh, after, af sorry, af after the house build is pretty much complete. Uh, so, so one thing at a time. Uh, the, the thing I would like to add to that though is, uh, so when we talk about the ent enterprise aspect, for me, like if I look at the package, okay, what do we need to, to go into the enterprise? One thing would be the facility, like we are planning on the schedule was for the latter half of this, this month to build a facility. It's about 3,000, 4,000 square feet which would be good for doing things like kid builds of the, of the CD home with the productivity of like, if there's 12 people working in there, you've got one kid per week is uh, assuming about the 500 uh, hour per kid, 400, 500 hour per kid kind of a, a build time, I would say 400 would be our goal. So if you got 12 people working at it eight hours a day that you got 100 hours per day. So in one week, in four days, you already have the, those 400 hours because uh, I could see a, a way where the kit, well, kits apply to everything. It's whether we want to sell that, we actually want to build, build it on somebody's site or whatever. So I think that's a clear way to organize. There's a production facility that actually does that. We can keep improving that facility with digital fabrication and so forth. But I think that's a clear, clear goal that can focus us to say, okay, we're developing this product and the production facility to do it in the lowest cost possible way uh, using all the techniques we have. We, we are getting the parts for the brick press cut out as we speak and and those will be arriving soon, so we can actually use use the bricks for the walls. So experiment with that as a um, as a way to, to build low cost infrastructures, which which the promise there is uh, free materials off the site. Uh, if you're providing your own labor, the total cost is a couple of cents a block just for gasoline. Um, that's what it costs to to compress the blocks if you have the machine. So okay, so that's kind of how I see this month definitely. Then the next month. We're branching out into more things like we were going to do the 3D printer, torch table, um, uh, get onto the, the actual plastic recycling infrastructure, which, which in my view could could reduce the, the cost point of the materials probably by half, 50% at least. And then we can continue doing that until uh, we effectively develop the whole infrastructure capacity to uh, to substitute our labor, our the value of our time for the things that money would otherwise buy. Just like one, one model for building like Habitat for Humanity, there's sweat equity. Well, if we have an infrastructure for that sweat equity person to be super effective, they can effectively be getting 50 to, to 100 bucks an hour of their time uh, if they, they have access to a facility like ours, which, which can then lead to a pretty clear business models on, on the, the sweat equity house building model that, that just breaks through some of the barriers on on price points for affordable housing. So uh, I think that that all fits again. And then after that, there's the summer of extreme design build. And I don't know how exactly we're going to handle that. The first three weeks are definitely taken with what that we want to participate fully. There's a bunch of people, about a dozen, that are still coming to that outside of us um, that have already signed up. And I'd actually like to see if we can do like a nice push for the builder crash course after we have the house and take some photo shoots and then we can say, okay, hey, people learn to build this. The, I mean, but I think the thing missing for me right now is we don't have anything to show that we're going to build this. We, you know, we can advertise, but I think a much more compelling story comes from build this right here. Here's how it looks and you know, all the time lapse videos and all the assets around that would make it very compelling. So, so the first three weeks is the, the two weeks is the builder crash course. The, the week after that is the, the Aquapana greenhouse. Um, we're somewhat reviving this greenhouse that's here. We're going to build another one just to show how, how the full build goes. Uh, probably on a little smaller scale, uh, probably like either 16 by 16 or 16 by 32. And then um, after that, there's more printer build, 
and then machines like all the CNC stuff in the second month and then the third month we get back to uh, more of the brick press there's a brick press build and a saw mixer build but otherwise there's other supporting machines around that um, so that's that's kind of how the, the summer looks and we'd have to like as we get closer to that we want to see how comfortable we are and basically like what what our goals are here okay what exactly I'm, I'm still rather fuzzy not not super clear like to what level of mastery do you want to take this house like because we can go into okay we bo bore down into okay here's the design part okay one is the build part but the second is how do you start redesigning these things I think that's the next step and then really understanding the economics of production that allows us to to manage production teams and, and I mean managing teams and workflows is another whole area so it's it's like depending on what you guys want to want to get out of this we can focus on it but we have those options and if if we do that during the if we have some time to do that during the summer of extreme design build uh, we'd have to think about how we divide the time because there's like all the other stuff with the machines and stuff and I don't know if we're gonna if we want to then break away to okay we're gonna delve into more detail on the CD home versus just participate in the machine builds that are there right there because we can do both um, at that time there's uh, enough time in that schedule it's basically an, an eight to five schedule every day then there's also the enterprise session in the evening for people who explicitly want to get into the CD home production so that means really getting into all the economics and workflow so it's more like the management if you're managing a build what do you need to know so with that said maybe some feedback a little bit of feedback on where we're we going to in terms of goal clarity and things like that so any any feedback and does it look like a decent plan to say okay we focus I, I think the, the what came out was we focus on the, just make sure we do one thing at a time and then move from one to the next so now the house um, any any controversy or <laughs> feedback? I think that sounds like a good plan. But I'm speaking to the house, doing the presentation at house. Mm -hmm. But also, like, uh, to continue with the enterprise event. Yeah, just in so, I mean, I would say that, and enterprise on, on which specific parts? Well, starting with the house. Yeah, with the house. Well, I mean, we can do that. So maybe what we do there is people who want to do that uh, can do it. People who don't want to do it don't. So we just divide that time like that. It's like, Ken, if you're interested in that, it's definitely, uh, you know, we can explore a lot of things there and just get into the numbers and all that and, and generating assets for what the business would look like. So uh, getting into uh, what your marketing side looks like, your sales side and stuff like that. So we can develop those assets I think they're generic that's that's what I was kind of trying to uh, say before that yeah we can develop certain assets that help everybody you know a business plan here's the the latest we know about the collaboration architecture for the um, for how you would get this out into affordable housing with cities like various various models but once again everything uh, the thing that's absolute critical is what exactly is that price point that we're getting to in terms of the ergonomics of production and the cost the amount of time it takes because it's effectively um, you know we decide our pay by how eff effective we are we look at our videos right now we can extrapolate from our videos maybe we do, do this simple exercise in a minute but you can take a look at our video well, how much time is it taking to build our our modules well multiply it by a hundred and you have a rough you know first order estimate of this is how much the house, house is going to cost in labor so it took you, say it took you uh, five hours, five hours, one hour, one hour to build a module. You can talk about the entire house times a hundred. Well, that doesn't add up though. There's too many. That's not a good, good order. Cause if, if it, each module took an hour, it's not going to take an hour. Some of the very simple modules take an hour, but there's plenty of other things that, that don't. But in terms of, if you wanted to get a cost structure for the, the framing, yeah, you can multiply it by a hundred by uh, the time it takes you to do one module, but specifically it's more like 70 modules times um, what it takes you to do one as a first rough estimate, you know, so uh, it's really it's really that uh, the numbers numbers are critical the final economic analysis. It's like, okay, cost cost of production your time labor materials so forth. Yeah, um, so we can do it. I'd like to do it um, especially if um, 
we can explore different options, like what if comparison, like we can do initial study, economic, it's like feasibility study, okay, if you're doing CEBs versus, because CEB is going to be relevant to you, not stick frame because you've got too many termites, and tropics, this doesn't apply. There's termites and you can't do wood. So basically this is a tempered zone climate material. Uh, so we can explore, okay, what's it look like and what's the cost of our production of the block and stuff like that and go from there, things like that. So lots, lots to explore. Any other comments? On, so other feedback on how to focus? Because I mean that, that can, I think, easily solve people who want to do other things. Feel free to do so. And then people want to join the enterprise and talk about numbers on a, on a business. We can do that as well. So there's, there's those two things. So the eco home and then the enterprise sessions focused around the eco home at night, which, oh, is, yeah. which is fine. I mean, that, that's the general focus right now. Mm -hmm. And then after we finish standing up the home, the big push is going to be for marketing to marketing the summer X and trying to get people aware of what's going on. Is that, is that kind of what the next thing? Well, in our ample spare time, like maybe we can do, we can do uh, that just a little bit, but I think the, the thing that reifies that makes it credible. Well, there's the, the facility, the production facility, the 4,000 square foot workshop that we want to build. Okay. Uh, rapidly and there we learn welding and and construction stuff and and about renewable energy because that's going to be off-grid and stuff like that so um, how long do you think that would uh, I think it would take two weeks okay. two weeks to do that uh, including the CEBs with the CEBs that means well, unprecedented look. efficiency of CEB production using a block per minute using the machine that we're going to build in a day so that kind of a thing so we got to uh, probably the best workflow there is to learn how to weld on trusses because those are super easy to do. And then we have a just basically set that up, get everybody welding. We've got six welders, they're uh, production welders, and we can just crank those out, learn how to weld, and then we can actually do the build. Like maybe do like a day of that. By that time, I mean you'll be like, uh, you'll probably be be confident in welding other stuff, uh, the brick press that, that we can do rather rapidly. And then I'll go into the machine, like all the rest of the machines and anything that we have. Yeah, I mean, that's that skill applies to everything that we build because welding is the cheapest way you can get large structures. Uh, I mean, you can use aluminum, you can use like the extruded tubing. That's ex very expensive. It's like three, five X the cost of anything you can do in steel. Steel is just the cheapest for uh, for the strength to performance ratio. And that's why uh, that's one of the most common um, common materials that are in use. There's a lot of aluminum too that's lighter weight, higher performance, but for heavy machines it doesn't really work that well. It doesn't, that is not as pl pliable as steel and it's more expensive. And then some heavy machines you want the weight. So, um, and abrasion resistance of hard steels like hard ox and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, so think about two weeks, two weeks on a house, two weeks on a workshop. That's kind of like, I'd like to see that. That does mean good focus on this. Like, so I wanted to go through some exercises that make sure we've got some of the basic skills. So with a set of basic skills, we can really crank out on these, finishing up these modules. Okay, but other comments, other comments on focus and motion forward. Uh, and I did see whoever didn't fill out the feedback form. Look on the first page of the doc. There's the feedback form. There's four people filled it out. We can. I'd like to go through that just a little bit, but before the clarity discussion. So, Anything um, else on the clarity discussion? Mid-August, you have about two weeks before the start yeah. of the summer, right? so then yeah. two weeks, um, you know, the party. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, build other stuff. Continue building stuff. Um, the the thing we were going to focus on that time is the 3D printer that can get us to half cost reduction here. So that's that's the big part. Okay. 3D printer infrastructure, shredder, filament maker. Printers, small printers for you guys, big printers for the world. Uh, we're all gonna build a printer. It's, it's, gonna, it's a quick one. I got pretty much. I got 12 sets of parts already printed. On, <laughs> I used uh, one of the universals to print all the parts. So it's like, oh, well, that's an example right there. We just printed like six thousand dollars worth worth of parts over the last week with this little machine. It's awesome, <coughs> right? I mean, that's an example of the economics that come out of this. You know, you know how to use it. You have a market. And you got a product. Uh, the whole thing is about we need to develop products that can be taken to that level where you're just cranking out and selling stuff. So that's that's the whole thing of the open source everything store and what we do here, the collaborative development. It gets us to that, that it's not just this printer, but next, cordless drill, 
whatever, everything. This, this whole thing of whole range of appliances, small power tools, all that. It's it's all game within this. Um, any other clarity discussion comments, uh, friends? Any thoughts? I just Paul, I just want to say um, that it sounds good to me, and um, mm -hmm. my my goal is definitely to uh, focus on a house, and so that that works. And and my biggest concern right now is just feeling confident and competent when it comes to building the house. I feel like in some ways the the sales and the marketing piece, it would be nice to be working on that collaboratively and stuff, but that's less of a concern for me than just feeling like I can actually do this. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and related to that, I think the other piece that is related is training and instructional materials. And, uh, and uh, so as we're learning this, if we can be developing kind of more uh, you know, just as concise and quick as possible, uh, that could serve as well for the uh, for when people come in September. Like we could try to be de developing that stuff now, and then kind of try it out. And, you know, try the training stuff out as people come and to to see if it really does uh, do the trick. Yeah, absolutely. I was hoping that we could do this collaborative Google Doc editing. That's not happening right now. I mean, I was hoping that basically as we speak, we're capturing everything. But I mean, we do have, that's not a lost cause because we do have the full recordings and then somebody could go back through that and actually make high quality materials from all the stuff that we're talking and actually organize it and make it rapid learning as opposed to kind of fumbling right now where we're, we're getting the quality up of this, but that's, that's a great job for somebody can do that remotely or anything like that. That would be great help. Um, and I think, David's done a little bit of that work on okay, how do you organize this and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it definitely lends itself to a larger collaborative process with, with everybody else who's who can be viewing this. Yeah. And then that would help us. Then we have materials for everybody. It's like you're gonna run your if you run your training programs in the future, well, it's already written down. It's all well organized and so forth. So that's why we want to do this now. We want to spend the time to start organizing every, everything now it's a hard process because to do to do the learning documentation at the same time that's like that's power user stuff but it's something i, I wish we could learn um i'm hoping that as we go through this uh we get better and better at it just you know as i'm talking here we can people can be writing and stuff like that um if we have more audiences maybe like when there's a little more audience here during the summer x maybe we can um we can do more of that, but yeah, it's it's a hard thing. There's a lot of moving pieces, but as we get comfortable and and skilled at adapt adept at understanding the little pieces of the whole collaborative game, that becomes a natural part that we start doing. And that's my hope that you can generate a large community that does that to make this happen in in real life. So that, for example, if you want to do a large hackathon, then you're producing documentation at the same time. It's well organized. Like I think right now, hackathon hackathons are largely wild events, and uh, I haven't really seen anything that's like super super tight. It's kind of like a like a very chaotic event. But I think if if people had more of the collaborative literacy thing within them, just like really understanding the power or like the techniques and and all that's involved in there, the remind shift of how that works, I think it could be much more productivity that happens and literally towards open product design as, a, as the norm in civilization. So obviously this doesn't happen because everyone will be doing it and there's some barriers to, to why it doesn't happen that we're exploring how to make it easier, the tools and infrastructure to make it happen. So we're prototyping all of that. I'm hoping that the CD Co home as built really soon, that's going to be my, um, my uh, like broadcasting centers. So it's part of that infrastructure, you, well organized to do video, to do product shoots, to do interviews, to, to podcast, uh, to have a good monitor set up to, to provide feeds from all over the campus. It's like your control center and possibly a remote control center, like, you know, explore the idea of remote control machines that you're basically monitoring, like eventually you're monitoring the digital farm, like your, your solar GPS tractor that's going through your orchard with dragging chicken tractors to keep them safe and, you know, Various things, uh, even things like you know foundation digging that you can do just from your computer remotely because we've mastered the technology for how you do remote control. It's like literally a video game in real life. And that's kind of what I see here. Uh, it might sound far out to some people. To some people, it might sound oh yeah, of course. But I think that's a 
it's kind of what what's happening is I mean things are getting automated and stuff like that uh, so um, that's the future on the documentation and the, the collaborative effort to get there so yeah uh, and yeah so yeah any other comments on uh, forward direction okay um, I like the focus away from the hero X because at least for me I felt like it was uh, a lot to think about that it's yeah. too abstract um, yeah and it was important the only thing I would actually be interested in helping with the things that you're doing to prep for us right now like generating the cut lists or printing the 3D part like you know I would, I would love to do 3D printer stuff like in the evenings or even on Saturday time we would have spent on Hero X if we got started on a 3D printer build. I mean, this is... Yeah, we could do that. This is just we speaking could, for me, but yeah. I can do sort of large numbers of parallel builds if we're building stuff, and I'm learning, then um, I get really engaged, and I would like, I'd love to spend more time on that, but if it's abstract creation discussion, that's kind of draining to me, and I, that's necessary, but I usually um, do that separately, like on my own time, and then I would love to have a feedback. I know some of us have interest or independent projects, so if we could present what we're doing, you know, we can read each other's logs, so that's kind of a solitary process as well. So if some of the group discussion could be us presenting the work that we've done. I know, like, a little bit of, you know, Wes is working on a game, and Joshua is, is working on setting up, uh, you know, sort of an open project server, and, um, you know, we're interested in the, reviving the, the greenhouse, maybe. So if there was like, you know, a small amount of time yeah. for us to talk about that, um, I would enjoy that too. But yeah, overall, I'm uh, really enjoying what's going on and I'm very focused. Yeah, yeah. And maybe we can, uh, let's, um, well, since we're on this topic, I mean, let's, let's kill this. Um, let's, let's do a little bit of it because just some priorities here, like for the aquaponic greenhouse workshop, I mean, what you guys are doing, I heard from Jeff that you guys are dipping into the greenhouse and actually fixing it up there. Uh, well, that greenhouse can look as good as in the pictures, like in a month time, because it's a, it's a, it's month, month cycles for growth of plants. So there's perlite and that you seed little things in pots and then you put them into the towers. The thing that about an aquaponic greenhouse, the thing that that's like the most amazing thing I've seen the, the greenhouse right there. We kept it and then gave up on it because of maintenance. And what is that maintenance? What it turned out was that after some time, you get the fish growing and all kinds of stuff floating in there. It's it's very probiotic. The what what happened at the end of the day all the time was I would have to spend like 15 minutes every day unclogging the clogged nozzles at the top. And after some time, I would just get no. This is okay. Let's call it a day here. That's not going to be a commercial operation if you have to do that. So uh, we have to redesign the watering system right now. That's the problem statement. So uh, we were using just simple aquarium pumps with about, with about 10 foot head. They're like these uh, submersible pumps. Uh, they don't have enough pressure that if things get stuck in the nozzle that, that it pushes the dirt through. So we just need to rework that. And at that point, it's like, yeah, you go in there, you pick in a bunch of stuff. There's some things that pretty much perennialize, like that are always like mint will take over, kale will take over like bok choy does amazing there's some crops that are just crazy productive and all of that you'll have pest issues too that you got to address but it's effectively like when we had it going it's like you go in there and you get your get your salad and it's like the coolest thing in the world to do that and that's that's the reality but then once once the maintenance came in and and having to do of course the other things in my ample spare time i said no i ain't i ain't doing this anymore this is we're gonna need to get to the next version so we basically shut it down we harvested about 200 pounds of fish uh, all the tilapia we put them in a freezer and uh, we called it a day and we can get that I think it would be nice very nice like the potential of that is is really high to do that without too much time it's not too much except for the one pond that collapsed <laughs> because uh, we drained the water out we, we had of course a few accidents where you leave the pump on and you forget it was on and the whole pond drained and stuff like that and that's when uh, the sides would collapse on it because those are deep ponds they were they were four feet initially like this deep dug with a backhoe um, so the sides collapse so we can fix that by 
reducing the depth to about two feet, which is still perfectly fine. We were doing the four feet because we wanted to say, okay, how can we max this out for amazing productivity? Because that, uh, that operation right there would produce, I think the number there was like once fully operational, like three pounds of fish per day. Insane, like insane productivity. Um, and to do that, you have to maximize the volume. You gotta make sure your filtering is good. But I mean, man, um, that kind of a greenhouse in a limit is marginally enough if you had it optimized to feed one, like one or two people. Like if you look at the actual numbers of, of energy the conversion from the available space and the, the part that's really good about it is 21 plants per tower. Usually you have one plant per one square foot. Here you go going vertical. You've got 21 plus the fish underneath and so forth. So it's a great system and it would be nice to have that revived so that people can see it when they come here for the workshop so they can see a functional version because what we build in a workshop, that's not, you know, you need a month for things to grow out. So, uh, but people can get an experience of the full build and how the systems work. So that's, that's one thing. Um, maybe on a feedback, just, just a little bit more to, to kill that issue off on the feedback form. So we, we talked about, um, I think we're talking about focus, pair program for learning. You mentioned Paul. Yeah, we could, we could probably try something like that. So maybe let's do what we're doing today, and maybe maybe you can help. Like to, maybe we can pair it up because I do like that. There's pair programming. That's that's Scrum stuff, Agile stuff. Um, that's cool stuff. Maybe we can do that. But let's let's try what we're doing today. Just I was thinking about. Uh, I, I heard from Katrina that. Some people were saying that, oh, um, this is like, you don't get much out of this because you can't practice it, it's too fast. But let's do like very little things that we can, we can actually do in real time to, to make that work. So let's try that. i see if that, that does work. Um, yeah, on a feedback form, like any other things that we wanna, um, like, improve, like improvement points, what's there to be said? Like, I definitely wanna see the improvement on starting on time on myself, which uh, kind of happened today. Uh, I'd like to continue that. Um, nailing the communications platform is the is the Discord the way, way to go. Is that acceptable yeah. for people? Yeah. Let's do that. So, what are suggestions that we can immediately implement to now to make things better? There's like people wanted to do stuff around the the facility, like the greenhouse or some of the hab lab, making it more comfortable. Some specifics, any any things that come up. Uh, just general, generally improvement points that we can activate right now. Like what about, for example, the, the central mic? Is that the thing we want to do? Like, I, do we have it? I think we should, yeah. <laughs> so we should test it out and make it work? Yeah. So maybe um, let's do that uh, uh, when? Yeah, if somebody has a condenser microphone, mine are dynamic, so they're meant for just one person. S or do but we need to get one? So maybe we can document that and get one if we don't have it. I have a snowball. Okay. Maybe that would work. Um, yeah. Well, if you're making the suggestion, can you test it out? Yeah, I mean... I'd love to do it in my ample spare time. But the way it works here, if you make the suggestion, don't suggest it for somebody else, suggest it for yourself. Ideally, that's the way it would work, so that you can actually help on it. I can help on things I can help easily with. Yeah, we can test it, but if you can help on it... Yeah, I mean, I have my Test it, then you got next step is test it. Test yeah. it, make sure the feedback's not there. Um, make it, let's make it work. Um, is there a way we can like take a break during the morning sessions to like work on these? The group format is good for discussion, but you know, not actually, usually not for implementation. Like, yeah, we should we should do the discussion and, and make sure everybody's clear, and then you know we should break break out. So as long as people are clear on what to do, then you know, we can keep a, like a Discord chat open or whatever. Um, but we should, yeah, I'd like to break out. So maybe after the morning session, if everybody's clear on what needs to be done, then we can do that immediately. One thing that uh, yeah. I think we need to do more uh, or to do better is um. Like from a productivity perspective, to uh, be more intentional uh, about creating um, smart goals, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time sensitive. Um, so we have a number of kind of 
kind of sub projects related to like the house build and stuff, um, whether it's developing construction materials and different aspects of the build. And so, uh, you know, clarifying what are our long term goals and then working backwards to identify like what needs to get done by when, who's working on them, and so that people have some clarity around what they're doing. And, and there's just from a psychological perspective, it's really important to have those clear goals, even if you don't meet the deadline, but to know, for example, that, okay, we want to finish getting all those, like those, um, the CAD files that are, you know, all in red for the parts, um, like when do we want to have those done by? And so what is our goal? Like each of us is going to try to do this many or, or certain people will work on them while others work on something else, but to have very clear, smart goals, I think will really, uh, help us to see results more efficiently. Okay. Well, with that and I think... I was just saying, and I think uh, project management software, you know, recently someone mentioned open project. Uh, I'm not familiar with that in particular, but it sounds cool. Like, I think something like that could help just to visualize kind of what are, what are our goals, who's working on what, what are, where are the deadlines, and so that, that might be useful. Yeah, so the, the link is actually, I think, in the Apprenticeship 2021. I set it up. Uh, It doesn't have the boards without enterprise available, but um, it does have like the, the general scrum agile features. You can do tasks, milestones, different phases. Um, Paul's accounts configured, my accounts configured, I can configure accounts for whoever wants access. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't finished building on a complete project yet. I just kind of wanted to have one as an example, but there are some demo projects in there that people can use to reference uh, how to do something. And, and what are you saying it can't do with, with the free account? So, um, have you heard of Trello or have you used like a Kanban board? I use Trello. I use Trello. Yeah, yeah. so that, that feature is available in Open Project. It's built out, but um, it's, it's paywall that you have to pay for enterprise uh, services for that. So, um, let, me, let, me, let me put the link again in general voice channel and then you can go take a look at it. I can make an account as well. If you just send me whatever email you want to use. Sure. Wait, sure. so if that's something specific we want to get onto, then we should get all educated on it. I mean, are, are we... No, uh... you're, you're, you're right. And then uh, I mentioned the, the BIM management. That's another version of that software. So the version that's installed now is just the standard. Uh, yeah, we just need to get those house modules uh, organized and catted up so we have a full digital model. That's like Okay, that's the central goal right now. Right. We need that for everything. Right. And so for, for that, it would be really useful to have, like, a clear deadline, like, okay, we're going to aim to have that done by next Friday, you know, and to get there, you know, this many people need to do this many things, and just to, so that we can all wrap our head around it. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and do we think, we got, going back to the open project, do you still think that it's better to go with open project than using just a free Trello account? We can use a free Trello account. I mean, if, if the Kanban board's a little bit more comfortable for people to use and, um, you know, everyone's familiar with it, I think that's probably the best way to get something something out at least that can, everyone can work at right now. Like, Trello board can yeah. be done right now. Okay, so why don't we, for tomorrow's meeting, who, who wants to present on how we're going to do this project management? Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. So somebody prepare that, and tomorrow we're gonna, all going to get on board on that. So I'll take that. Okay. And then with, you know, consideration, of course, from everyone. I'd be interested in working with that on you if you want. Okay. So I'm putting slide two, so tasks. This is task, task allocation, task division. So... Joshua on Trello or, or uh, basically PM board, whatever that is. Uh, we'll take, oh, no, do you want to work on that mic thing? So that's something we're going to implement? Um, yeah, the, but just to be clear, the mic, the central mic wasn't the idea. My idea is having an audio mixer. We do we have that? No. Okay, so let's define it and, and let's look at it if that's something we want to buy. Okay. So, 
Uh, that would be relevant for things like podcasting. We, I mean, we could get that. That would be that could be in a in a film studio budget. I mean, I mean, we we got to get really good at this. We're really uh, effective communication across spewing forth across the net. Um, anything else for specific suggestions we can act on? So Odundo, maybe uh, can you take a look at that and report to us tomorrow? So tomorrow's morning meeting, we'll, we'll look into that. I mean, this is all part of the collaboration architecture, so yeah, yeah let's do that. Uh, anyone else? Um, anything else for tomorrow? Um, I would actually like to ask, so, so for the enterprise session, Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so that Brian could participate on Wednesday. He has class on Tuesday. Uh, he teaches social enterprise, so um, enterprise seminar. Where I mean, I'd like to see as we're working on assets, like we're we're looking at here's things that we want to generate for that enterprise. Is that yeah? So keep doing it, but more like a working meeting where we generate assets for that that people can use. Um, because otherwise, I mean, you can study all this stuff, the standard business uh, development procedures. Yeah, I mean, we can, documenting that, making that accessible, that's part of the game too. Um, okay. Anyone else on things that we can report? So, I mean, that's not, that's not really something I'm going to report tomorrow. That's, we're going to do that Wednesday. Um, anyone else? Anything? So feel free to... Use this slide. Uh, so we'll add that to tomorrow's agenda. So we're basically taking taking each document the day forward. We'll just uh, use this as part of the agenda. Anything else that emerges? Like, are y'all able to edit this? Uh, are you not? Keeps on, even though the document is editable, whenever I copy it, reverts it back to not editable. That's Google. So you just got to actively select editable every time. So now you should be able to edit if you refresh. I'll try to remember that. I don't know, Matt, uh, if you've got any suggestions on the documentation part, yeah, that's, I don't know if we can do anything about that in a different way. Documentation of, like, instructional stuff or the for the task? Yeah. Oh, what you mentioned about documenting the... Instruction, yeah. I don't know if people saw I put up a link. Better documentation. I put up a link to the... Um, uh, a free CAD uh, uh, Google slide thing that I started creating based on what I, what I started trying to do is taking like your video on like rotating and moving objects and like kind of highlighting the key points in slides with, with some string shots and, and some times uh, where people can see that. Um, um, so yeah, right, that? right there. It's right, uh, it's right there. Uh, right yeah, right there. Oh, okay. So I don't know if if this is something that people yeah. like, but I feel like it might be more accessible and easy to reference than just having the videos. Yeah, um, yeah that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Great. That's one step. Yeah. So I, I, what I do is I typically just go and how to move and rotate. And I'm, I'm wondering where, I don't know if, if there's a better way to... Um, stuff is managed that I'm just not aware of, but like, uh, uh, how do we make it as accessible to po as possible? Like, where should this live on the wiki where others can find it? I'm not sure if that structure is already clear and exists in your mind, or? Well, you can find recent stuff is the understanding there is recent wiki changes if somebody knows that. If they don't, uh, what's, we should have something probably under, under uh, OSC apprenticeship. And I'm, I'm thinking of almost like something that's more like, uh, I feel like you know, that we should have different routes to get there. But like, if there were like a like an outline form, like a tree that's hierarchical and logical, so that people, 
you know, at any point in the future could come back and say, I want to know where, you know, you know, yeah. the tutorial on this is. And so we could just have like a free cab thing and, the, and it's all the free cab relevant things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd be happy to contribute to that, but I just, I'm not sure how to set that up in the wiki or the best approach for that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, declare something. So that one page that exists right now is design lessons, 120 design lessons, and that indexes, uh, we're going to have 120 of these things at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that's what we got right now. We're just indexing here. So um, the videos, I think, on YouTube, they're like the clearest paper trail of, because here you can go through from day one. So like here it's, you know, day one, 120 design lessons, day one. So when you go up in this history, you go through every day. So it's chronologically oriented because we do everything, you know, every day something gets uploaded there. That's one, one organizing piece. If you, if people know about that. Yeah. I, I spent uh, I spent like three hours a day going through like old videos and the things that I hadn't um, been a part of, and, and I my only fear with that uh, is once you really have 120 days worth of stuff, it's gonna be so hard to wade through. So like I feel like having this plus like an outline that orders you know organizes this in terms of like the you know morning sessions versus build time lapse versus you know like it just be useful to have them through. and maybe that's creating playlists I, I don't know you know right uh we have the content so it's like the rough rough draft the open source dirty version is is out there the next steps are to index it to organize it to turn it into high quality effectively even to productize it this could be turned into a product that can be sold even um and you can actually be honest to the open source method you can have the uh, it's all online if you want like value added maybe you even have to pay for it or whatever or, and we can have various levels of that especially if somebody were to create courses based on this but i mean yeah we're just dumping everything here with a possibility of future future upgrade and that's that's it happens naturally that that happens all the time people will draw from this and look back at this and and so forth so so that process kind of automatically starts happening once you have the assets so right now we have the assets, but but not the organization and, and idea that would be that would happen in the future. If there's more resources of dedicated people who are actually um, organizing this stuff and making it user friendly. Sounds good. Anything else? So so I like I like the digital housing model. Um, that we're building, it gives a lot of clarity, but like, um, what about, what about like when the modules change? And that's something I'm worried about, it's like, we want to get, right. like, as soon, if you change one module, well now you have to update every single other module. And yeah. also like, if people want to, um, build like a, an aquaponic greenhouse under their house, yeah, I mean, the, the, the way it starts right now, right now, the capacity is there. Like, it's not blown up that you can't do that. Right now, you can go back and edit one module. Let's say it's changed, and then you can merge it back to the final doc. So that doc's going to have, like, 100, 100 modules. You can take any one of them. There's a change in one. Now, if you got to make a comprehensive change throughout, this is where parametric and, and designers come in, like the FreeCAD designer or scripts that do this, like, once this is even more digital. Right now, we're just at that first phase where we're just getting that whole digital model. So once we have that completed, then we can think about, oh, okay, now here's how we're going to parametrize and make it even more digital, more information upon it to make it into a complete designer set. Once, we've, once we stabilize the modules, they're going to be like, there may be like a stable version and then continually evolving things, but part of the evolution is the designers the, and parameterization that, that can happen. The basic workflow that we were, have right now allows us to make changes. Like what we're doing right now is just the plain modules, but we can immediately go into the source file, which we saved positionally correct, and we can just merge it again. Say we put the holes where we throw in the lag bolts to connect panels together. That's a, that's a simple change within a source file and a few seconds to merge it into the master file. That's the process 
only process I know of that doesn't lock things down. There's more sophisticated processes with, with million dollar CAD packages that do that, but that's literally what you're talking about. You're talking about advanced functionality, and we can build that up over time by all means. And I think FreeCAD is well, very well positioned because you can parameterize each module, and we say, bam, uh, make, make all these, like change the utility channel in all the modules, right? Because we're fumbling around with that, for example. You know? Uh, we thought we talked about um, if we could move to like three ten nineteen, all these yeah. reasons are sticking with the sixteen. So um I look at it as the inclusive part, like FreeCAD 19 is a little harder to learn. So I, I was thinking we we do six stick to sixteen because it's easier. It doesn't doesn't have all the things in a pot tree, <coughs> which then you if you want to manage things in the simple workflows, then you have to manage more parts in a part tree. Now, power users can use it, but yeah, I mean, that's an open question. It's like the, the way I'd like to see it is that more people have the opportunity to learn it faster. I think you can, you can learn FreeCAD 16 faster, just my experience. Like when I start getting into FreeCAD 19, there's just a few more pieces of information that you have to know on, uh, for an already complicated process. So. That's the reason for going to sticking with 16, because it's sufficient. Um, unless there are specific features that we need in other one, uh, in like 19, then we can use the other one. And there are features that are insufficient in 16. You can't the the part animations, exploit part animations, will always crash. So I download a FreeCAD 19 app image for that. But I always work in FreeCAD 16 because my priority is inclusive. It's about including more people. It's the, the barriers, the lower the barriers you set for entry, the more people are going to be potentially collaborating here. Like, what if, what uh, if we I don't know how you can measure that, but I mean, that's the kind of evidence I have right now. Like what, when I go into FreeCAD, I can tell you my experience with it. And it's like, man, like what is all this trash in a part tree? Like it's confusing to me. What you have to learn, learn some more things. The video, like the instructional, like that, that you have, you know, you, you, bas you basically go through what we have to do to get the badge. Like you go in and do the sketcher, go to the part design, you, you extrude it out. I, I did that in, in 19, and I mean, it, like you said, there is more information. It took me a little bit to figure out the body, um, you know, in one plane or another. But once you figure that out, then it's, you know, then you kind of have it. But is that like, something we want to throw on to novice, novice users who are not power users? Like, I don't think it's something that we, like, with everything else going on, probably not right much. now, but when would you, you know. When do we want to switch? Like, when, when do you think it would be feasible? Because it, it, feasible it really has to be a good decision because we've seen that 19 isn't compatible, and then the future versions won't probably be back to compatible either. There are 20 right now with development build. So. Well, uh, I would... I'd never switch if the process, I look at the criterion of sufficiency. What's the process we use and is it sufficient for what we want to do? For the simple workflows that we're devising, it's sufficient. So the logic is we don't want to go any further. Now it's not the latest and, and you can do like animate, exploded part animations, but those are I think a little more advanced than average users. I mean, I'm open to, to go into it if people have a you know, if I'm open to doing it, but I mean, I don't see it meeting the goal of inclusivity. Like, how is that inclusive if it takes you longer to learn it? Well, I would like to voice support for 19, and I'm also interested in, like, exactly what's harder to use, and if there's a way we can just hide those or disable them or just tell people, like, not to use them in 19, because, um, you know, I was trying to help a beginner get started, and the fact that you have to downgrade from the latest version is a, is a hurdle to begin with, and that's like kind of discouraging that you downloaded the wrong version, but you're like, oh, the community is using it, I see it on the website, um, but now we have to use this other version, and I have to remember which version I'm using when I talk to someone in the future, and I say FreeCAD, I have to say FreeCAD 16 versus 19. Well, the idea there was OSC Linux, it already has it, so that sure. hurdle wouldn't, wouldn't be there. So if you're plugging into the integrated development architecture, then you want to make every tool as simple as possible because what what i'm seeing so once take a look at cura so lols bot cura we're using a version from 2016 as well it's the best interface and the current ones are to me like super i mean i just don't like don't like them 
And um, once again, it's for user, the Cura, the Lulzbot Cura edition, which we use, is optimized for Linux and it's optimized for a simple user interface because we're doing CAD, we're doing 3D printing, we're doing torch table, we're doing all these things, so you better read us. So if you did just free CAD, yeah, we could do that, but I'd like to see an ecology of everybody sprouting up one of these things that are super capable operations they're diverse. The diversity is more important than proficiency in a single tool. That's a general philosophy here that uh, it, it aligns with the idea that right now, if we used what we have in technology, we don't need any more technology. If we used all the technology that we have today wisely, we can survive 10 times over. Like it's not, it's not an issue. So there's a, there's a particular logic about appropriate tech. Like you don't need to go up, go up to it if you can use the existing tech wisely, or it's more important to use an integrated set of tools than a few tools uh, better. Like that's how we get the siloed world. Like each specialist just knows one thing. They have no idea how it connects to anything else. And that's how we mess up this world. So it's connected to this much deeper philosophy of let's, let's be more generalist, use simpler tools and have broader capacity for that kind of creativity. I can tell you that definitely boundary crossing is a thing, like all the actions at the boundary. Like if you can cross between boundaries, what you'll find is that you're going to be learning, learning new disciplines faster and faster. Once you learn one discipline, that's, I think, how learning works, is you see, see patterns that are applicable in other areas. So that's part of that kind of infrastructure where we're, we're, um, we're teaching more generalist skills for... Like if you talk about the global village, the vision there is it's a campus that's got everything. You've got an economy. You've got agriculture, you got manufacturing, you got personal development, you got all these aspects. But that means you gotta make the barriers to, to all those like as low as possible to make it just like our you know, like our three D printers where we're just reducing that it's that degeneracy concept. We're reducing to a small set because the number of things you can do is infinite. Like the number of kinds of wheels you can get for a car is like thousands or possibly millions of different kinds of wheels, uh, whatever. Uh, but use the smallest set so it's manageable and that's that's the kind of philosophy behind it does that make any sense or we're managing a more robust set smaller generative set of parts that can do more it's like the 80 20 where you can do like 80 percent of the things with the small subset of things that's that's the gen generic philosophy for how, how even I would dream of these holistic infrastructures for communities in the future uh, where I think the problem we're trying to address one of the issues in, in terms of societal design is the disintegration and it manifests down to the human people are disintegrated you know we kind of deal uh, integrated integrated learning integrated technology sets integrated uh, livelihood it's that kind of a perspective uh, where these properties like using simpler tools is part of that philosophy so yeah I mean I understand the philosophy behind it but um, as somebody who's uh, downloaded uh, OSC Linux I've actually gone back to using Ubuntu because I mean I'm already you know logged in everything on <laughs> Ubuntu I'm, I'm just looking for the convenient solution and uh, as looking at it from the perspective of somebody who's just getting started, you're going to have to, um, you can't just go on Ubuntu software and download uh, FreeCAD 16, like it's, it's just less convenient to install, and so um, that's also, there's also a balancing act there. And yeah, but what about OSC Linux 1? Right now I say use OSC Linux 1 or 2. 2 has never been finished, it's like... That's, um, that's the thing, like you're, you're on a particular image of, of Ubuntu, right? We there? were on Ubuntu 16.04 on so, on Linux One, and now we went to Mint because so uh, the next guy liked Mint. Right. So that has long-term support, 16, but it, it, like you're just you're missing features, you're missing performance enhancements. Like with with software in general, and kind of like with our hardware, it's constantly evolving. And, yeah. You know, yeah. if you want the if you want the feature set, it's still the same tool. There may be a little bit of a different UI to it, but it's still the same tool underneath. It, it, 
you really want to try to get as much out of it as you can. I mean, yeah. free cash is one thing, but if you use an older version of Linux, there's other things that are missing out of it, like yeah. even security fixes and updates and but like other bugs that were squashed. Well, I think that uh, the solution in in the open source game is always an and, so we can have both. Yeah. Um, but um, like, what do we say for? Can we have both? Yeah, I mean, there are incompatible. No, you, you really can't, can't really, because for free see, if you do specifically, a, it has to be a good decision. You know, it has to be like a OSC push, like if you were using 16 or we're using 19, because trying to use either or probably won't work with the way things are changing. So what's the what's the reason for not using 16? Well, so I appreciate the argument that you presented as well. Because discussion who are not software geeks who like don't, yeah we don't we don't really care they just want the one simple thing to use you know I belong to a maker space and we use Corel Draw probably on a pirated version of Windows 95 to drive the laser cutter and they were fine like they would they didn't really see a reason to change it because it worked and the difference is that you know Corel Draw is not open source and so the ecology is not just our ecology it's like the whole world of open source software so free cat is a community I think they're really proud that OSC uses them. And, um, you know, if we ever talked to them or interacted more, and it turned out that we were using like, this old version, and we never told them, we never gave them the feedback, like, oh, we actually find 19 hard to use. Can you make a beginner, like, an easy mode? You know, like, the default is a hard mode. Can you make an easy mode in FreeCAD 20 or something? And then, you know, we would love to uh, collaborate or help you test that as well. Yeah. So, yeah, because those kinds of discussions are on that community there. There's, uh, I, I of course piped in about the simple workflow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay, but but what's the answer to the question? What is, why is 16 not adequate? Because can we agree to the sufficiency criterion? Is sufficiency a a bad bad design here if it's sufficient because the advantages I can point to an advantage is, is a low lower learning curve pending people having Linux like they got to be able to install Linux one way or another I mean without both the tools one and that two has the has the 16 yeah like without tools that were built it is kind of difficult to get Linux installed. Like if you didn't have like the universal USB installer or some other tool to do it for you, it's, it's a little cumbersome. So but extract you need the image it. and then put it correctly in the drive and then have it... But the thing is, the Google, like, if we let people download all the software that's thousands of hours collectively wasted, like you need Cura, you need the Arduino environment with particular things, like you need plugins for FreeCAD because we already created several workbenches in FreeCAD for OSC. So you gotta download this whole slew that's gonna be like hours. So that's why we created Linux, OSC Linux. It's got the whole dev environment. Otherwise it's intractable. So the assumption has to be that you're using OSC Linux if you're gonna be developing in a core way, if you're serious about developing here. Then you, otherwise you're just wasting a bunch of hours getting the right, getting the right software. So uh, that, that's there. So the assumption can be that we are gonna use OSC Linux. Otherwise we're wasting huge amounts of time. And that's that's the whole thing for going to OSC Linux. It was that every time somebody would come here, it's like you're just spending all your time downloading software instead of learning. That was the practice. So that's why we went to OSC Linux. So you have to have it if, you, if you're gonna run workshops. You can't do without like a some kind of a pre-installed system if you're gonna do the education model for computer software. That would work only for power users. Or you want everybody. So that's, so Linux, uh, a, a canned distribution has to be there. Well, I don't think we all are using OSC, the, re, the same version or OSC Linux at all. Like, I use my desktop and I'm not using OSC Linux. Yeah, but you're a power user, so, so yeah. that's, that's, that's fine. That's, that's a good point with, for power users versus just people who need the tools and don't yeah. necessarily know how to write a script to go install it for you or go read the directions on how to install it. So that's, I think that's fine. I use elementary OS over here. I wrote a script to install software that was needed. I looked at the list. 
the workbench, like, I have it. Yeah, like, if you're running a workshop, you want to have it on a disk where you can just pop it in, like, hey, you, you want this on your laptop as yeah. a separate OS to install, like, fine. That's that's a good use case. And that's what we do. So for, like, for Summer X, the requirement is come in with OSC Linux, or we're going to be fumbling around getting that installed here, and you're not going to be learning as much as you could. Well, you know? I mean, we'll have it here. We could have it here available. Yeah, well, like we do. We, we have the USBs. And even with the USBs, some people have, like, that's why I tell people, it's like, make sure you get this thing running before you come. And nobody does still. <laughs> I mean, you still half the people do. Experience uh, performance issues because it's all loaded in memory rather than, you know, like if it booted off the drive. Well, if it's booted off the drive, my experience has been that it's actually faster because it's in RAM. Right, it's all in memory. So yeah. It's, well, I'm getting a sense that there are like three hardcore Linux geeks here that really love installing software and would do it for fun. Um, and then other people who don't really have that desire. So um, I am happy sort of cataloging what uh, is hard to use about FreeCAD 19 and then in a separate thread on our own time, kind of like working with the FreeCAD community long term to improve it such that it's something that OSC could recommend wholeheartedly as being inclusive. And uh, yeah, I, I'm getting the sense that it's easier and better for everyone to stick with the recast system right now. So I mean, I'm okay with any the discussion, but I'm interested in hearing what you know non Linux geeks feel about it. Yeah, so that's only one one viewpoint. People who enjoy software. Sixteen works. We got the we got the housing model. Work. I mean, it obviously works. It's just the high version. That's it. I'm not using uh, Linux. I have it on the on my drive, to check off. But um, I think what's annoying is that every time when I put it in, I have to set up everything again. Um, set up, uh, yeah. it's, it's like when you're you're not. Well, it's the persistent time. versus yeah. You have to either install it or you have to yeah. set up everything all the time when you do live. Okay. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, we could we could document this this uh, discussion. We are by recording this, but I mean, sufficiency criterion. Unless there's a compelling reason to to go complicated. Yeah, I can do I can do research on actually what the the, the code differences between the sixteen and nineteen are, and then I discuss that more. Yeah. Um, and the idea there yeah. is not a generic question, it's a specific, it's a use case specific question. This is what we do at OSC in our workflow, so how does that tool match that? That's that's the real question, because you can't just say, oh, in, in general, FreeCAD 19 is better, which it is, but that's not what, maybe that's not what we're doing here. Because we are doing different things here. It's, what we're doing is much different than standard workflows. And that's what we're proposing as the value proposition. We're saying we can actually get unprecedented collaboration using this, this kind of method. And we haven't done that yet. I mean, we don't have thousands of people doing that yet. But I know it, it, it will be harder with, um, I think it will be harder definitely from my experience using the more advanced tools um, which is a philosophy across the board here like like we're not using like a five thousand dollar ten thousand uh, dollar hydraulic motor like you know a um, bobcat no like a like a some kind of a tractor we use we're just saying oh we're just gonna use this hundred eighty eight dollar motor that we can get and we have the skills of how to scale it by different means like the parallel ability like that thing like it's all tied up in a in the whole kind of philosophy of how we do things um, to make it accessible because otherwise we're it's a philosophy that underlies it's not only software it's how we build hardware it's how we want to build civilization for access not specialized like we're just saying less specialized, more generic purpose tools are a viable way to go and they could have some advantages. 
If you want to find out more about this, read the book called The Second Industrial Divide. That's a seminal book that for the kind of stuff we do here. Like I would say like Gandhi's autobiography, Second Industrial Divide, and Small is Beautiful are kind of the, the main um, books that discuss this, this distributed production kind of a thing. Um, smaller scale, like how things can break down at scale. But the argument is that from Second Industrial Divide is that a bunch of more generic multi-purpose tools can and does compete with centralized production. So that's the, that's the thing there. And that's how does that relate? Well, we're saying those are not the most spe specialized high power tools. They're more generic, lower brow, not as complex. But because of those features, they're easier to maintain, they're easier to use, they provide a better experience or whatever. Um, while retaining the productivity. We cannot lose the productivity. If, if we're going to start losing productivity in FreeCAD 16, I'll be the first one to, to switch. But for what we need to do, uh, I think it's the most productive we can be. So we always talk about productivity, industrial productivity on a small scale. That's, that's one of the metrics. So, so besides that, um, yeah, Matt? Uh, I was just saying, well, two things. One, for some reason, all of a sudden, your, the audio started kind of going in and out. Uh -huh. I don't know why that is, uh, but um, uh, but yeah. yeah. So what you're saying makes sense to me, and and, and I like the idea of focusing on what is sufficient to be productive, and just also because if we then need to feel like we need every time there's a new version that we then need to rework everything and our materials and stuff. That I see the the challenge of that as well. So uh, yeah. All right, so anything else on feedback, on, on process optimization? Okay, so let's go, um, so it's already an hour has passed. What I wanted to go through is uh, just some exercises in FreeCAD, just to do, make sure that we're all on the same page. Because the idea here is that the house master file should be something that, uh, in principle, like we should be able to get within um, more rapidly than now. I mean, I think a lot of people are confused on just the process and how it works. But there's it's, the process is made up of small steps that are bite-sized and understandable. So I was thinking we could go through some of the steps um, to get there. Um, do we want to take a, like a little break and come back to it? Because basically, I wanted to do like 30 minutes of getting through these various features or processes within FreeCAD that we can explore and actually practice real time, uh, so yeah. we get good at it. Take a little, take a five minute break or, and uh, come back to this. Okay. <laughs>